Tonight, tonight, we'll be hearing from Barb Lamons, a longtime member of the League of Women Voters of Wheaton. She currently serves on the Illinois General Assembly Ranked Choice Voting Task Force. She's on the planning team for the League National Institute for Civic Discourse and also serves as co-chair of the League of Women Voters of Illinois Miss and Disinformation Task Force. And appropriately enough, tonight she'll be speaking to us about Miss and Disinformation. Um, one uh, or two admin details. If you have questions for Barb uh, at any point throughout the presentation, just type them into the chat. We'll be collecting those and we'll go through those at the end of her remarks. Um, we're also going to leave everybody on mute. Uh, we've got, I think, 60 something folks that have registered. So uh, just to keep things orderly, we'll just leave everybody on mute and then and then uh, come back at the end of the presentation to go through the chat questions. So with that, uh, Barb, thanks again so much for agreeing to join us this evening uh, and please take it away. Oh, thank you, Bill. And thanks everyone for spending some time with us this evening. Um, early this, earlier this year, the League of Women Voters of Illinois recognized that the proliferation and dissemination of mis- and disinformation has emerged as a significant threat that can undermine democratic processes, social cohesion, and individual decision-making. In response, the League of Women Voters of Illinois created a task force dedicated to countering these threats. The proposed task force hopes to minimize the impact of false information through education and awareness in order to achieve a more informed and resilient society through education and awareness. So what is mis- and disinformation? Misinformation is the false or inaccurate information that is mistakenly or inadvertently created or spread. The intent is not to deceive. Disinformation is false information that is deliberately created and spread in order to influence public opinion or obscure the truth. Why don't we call disinformation fake news? Because the term fake news has become to mean much more than just false information. The term is now used in a much broader sense to discredit or opposing viewpoints, um, cast doubts on political opponents, controversial issues, and the credibility of some media organizations. One thing that we have to be aware of is that we are all susceptible to mis- and disinformation, which is why awareness is so important. As you can see on the chart, all age groups are getting more and more of their news from social media where mis- and disinformation flourishes. When news started migrating to social media, it accelerated some of the changes already underway in the journalism industry. In the 50s and 60s, TV news in particular was more viewed by broadcasters as a public service. In the 80s, however, entertainment conglomerates began buying up networks and started expecting news networks to turn profits like other entertainment divisions. Soon came the 24 hours news cycle, an emphasis on rapid and attention grabbing stories. Then came the emphasis on pundits, journalist, journalistic figures designed to deliver opinions, not always facts. As the news industry changed, so too did people's expectation of what the news should look like. With the shift to social media, these dynamics have even intensified. Wherein anybody can be a journalist, Contest, content is near endless and easily capable of supplying social media feeds with hundreds, during the 24, hundreds of stories during the 24 hour news cycle. Instead of opinion sections or dedicated programs for pundits, social media feeds mix opinions and facts together. And the more outlandish the story, the better it does. With fast paced, sensationalized news coverage and opinion becoming more and more extreme, more of what we see online is disinformation, content that simply gets the facts wrong. Mis- and disinformation can take various forms, from satire to fabricated content. Satire and parody can mislead, but they really are a, a genre that intentionally exaggerates the news for comedic effect. 
while disinformation is intended to mislead and present false information as fact. Examples of satire or parody would be The Onion or The Babylon Bee. Headlines such as the new NFL rules require opposing teams to just hug it out are meant to be outrageous and funny, but yet many take that as fact. Imposter content is another form that's frequently seen on uh, social media. Imposter content is when genuine sources are impersonated. For instance, established news agencies. These imposter sites take advantage of the trust and reputation of established news agencies. We often see as part of missing disinformation is manipulated content when genuine information or imagery is manipulated to deceive. For instance, the image on the left was doctored to become the image on the right. Th this image was posted on social media, supposedly showing Senator Amy Kombachar in the right-hand side of the doctored photo and Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison at a meeting where signs were supposedly held supporting defund the police but the image was doctored. You can see the original photo on the left doesn't show anyone holding signs and Amy Kolbachar wasn't even there. Misleading and manipulated content can also be when information is used to frame an issue or an individual and give a false sense of reality. You can see on these two photos, how where the photo was taken and what angle the photo was taken from can relay totally different information. We also see as part of mis and disinformation fabricated content, stories that use graphics to put into a uh, context that they weren't originally meant for. This is when the headlines or visuals or captions don't support the content. This map that was used to show that 97% of all guns are in red territory was actually a map that was taken from the website media to show how political division was being was developed, was, was actually held within the United States. Often, many times, the images that we see on social media are making false connections when headlines or visuals or captions don't support the content. For example, on February 19th of this year, multiple posts on X, formerly known as Twitter, falsely stated Executive Order 9066 is rewarding these illegals with $5,000 gift cards. The truth is no one who enters the US illegally receives $5,000 gift cards from the federal government. Actually, February 19th was the anniversary of Executive Order 9096, which was issued by President Franklin Roosevelt in 1942, which authorized the forced removal of anyone deemed a threat to national security from the West Coast. It paved the way for the relocation and incarceration of an approximately 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry, including U.S. born citizens during World War II. False news sites consist of totally fabricated content. This is meant to deceive and they're meant to do harm. The headlines appeal to our emotions, fears, and curiosity. They use excessive capitalization and exclamation marks. When you look closely, where is the byline to these stories? In the upper right-hand corner, you can see that they are looking for anybody to submit a story. They're asking for citizen reporters. These websites create flash, flashy headlines that draw attention and then hope the reader will take the headline as fact without exploring further and share the story without reading. Sharing without reading can then make these stories look like they're gaining popularity or trending. This makes it even more likely that more people will share. For example, researchers examined 2.8 million online news articles that X, formerly known as Twitter, users shared and sometimes even commented on. 
According to computer records, users share the stories without having read them. It's clear that people are quite happy to share, retweet, or things like that without ever having read the complete article. NPR pulled a pretty masterful April Fool's prank many years ago. They published an article on social media that entitled, Why Doesn't America Read Anymore? They put it on Facebook and the responses were instantaneous. The likes and comments came pouring in the joke was this, no one actually read the article. They were so eager to endorse because if they had, they would have seen that it was in fact criticism of how people are passing links along or worse, comment online about articles without reading them. In fact, the article was only a few sentences long and said exactly that, but people were too busy sharing and didn't even know that it was an April Fool's joke. The biggest threat that is anticipated for the upcoming election is the use of artificial intelligence. It will increase our skepticism and create even more confusion about what we're seeing and hearing. One picture uh, before you of the butterfly is a photograph and the other one has been generated by AI. Can you tell which one is created by the artificial intelligence? It's actually the butterfly on the right is made by artificial intelligence. Here's another example. Can you tell which picture was created by artificial intelligence? Well, if you said the one on the right, you would be correct. That's the one that was created by computers. AI is advancing, so now it's so easy to create images that all you have to do is dictate what you would like the image to look like to create deep, these deep fakes. So what we all need are some tips for spotting artificial intelligent created material. One way to do it is to look at the hands. AI software has a history of generating human hands with too many fingers or other oddities, though technology is getting better fast. You can zoom in on any inanimate objects in the image to see whether they feel kind of off. You know, focus on items um, in images like eyeglasses or fences or bicycles to see whether they have any telltale flaws. If you're wondering whether an image is made by AI, look for writing on objects such as street signs or billboards and see whether it's backward or nonsensical. You can also scan the background. AI-generated images may have blurry or distorted details, particularly in the background. And you can check whether the images are overly glossy or artistic looking. Some AI-generated images of real people appear garishly stylized or depict people with plastic looking faces. After using all the signs and checks and you're still unsure, you should be asking yourself, the questions is what the is the image being shared by a reliable source and are there separate reports of the image being seen in other google searches or in other ways that you do your investigation sadly with the development and existence of ai deep fakes candidates for elected office are going to be very cautious of being recorded as their words can be altered and manipulated by bad actors wanting to influence our elections. One of the other things that we need to recognize with false in information, with mis- and disinformation, is we need to learn to recognize our own biases. Bias is defined as a, as a partiality that prevents objective consideration of an issue or a situation. And how does this play when in the fact that we share mis- or disinformation? The way we process information is important to understand. Our brains are wired to simply to simplify the complex world around us. The mental court shortcuts that we utilize, such as bias, can lead us to believe mis- and disinformation. We all have biases. And bias is basically a lack of objectivity when looking at something. A bias can be intentional or it can be unintentional. 
and will result in our choice to be for or against something or to support something or not support it. For example, fans of sports teams often vocalize that their hometown teams are the best in their respective leagues. Whether the team is winning or not, a fan will often be biased toward a favorable view of that team. Confirmation bias is another, is just one of the other ways we process information. Once we form a first impression, it becomes extremely difficult to change our minds. We tend to pay attention to those things that support or are consistent with our beliefs and ignore the facts that contradict them. Unfortunately, this type of bias can prevent us from looking at situations objectively which in turn can influence the decisions we make, and as a result, lead to poor, faulty choices in what to believe. During an election season, for example, people will tend to seek positive information about their favorite candidates while overlooking looking and paying attention to negative information. And what they'll do is they'll only pay attention to the negative information about the opposing candidate. By not seeking out objective facts, interpreting information that in, in a way that only supports their existing beliefs, and only we only remember details that uphold these beliefs, people often um, they miss information that could be important in reaching a decision on which candidate to support. So, confirmation bias urges us to accept information that conforms to our beliefs. Cognitive dissonance is another concept that encourages us to reject information that challenges those beliefs. So cognitive dissonance is that uncomfortable feeling that happens when we encounter ideas or beliefs that conflict with what ideas that we already hold. So what we do is we tend to minimize those contrary beliefs or delegitimize people who hold them. So confirmation bias combined with the cognitive dissonance and the algorithms of social media can result in the fact that we will live in a filter bubble where we only see more and more from sources that have similar content that we already believe in. You know, just as a refresher, the social media algorithms Use the data of what you have liked and what you have shared in the past to decide what to show you next. The result is, is that the, you will end up seeing more and more stories that support the beliefs that you have already formed on fabricated information. So what do we do going forward? Going forward, before you share or click on social media, or share stories that you've read with your friends, you need to slow down while you're reading and actively look for signs of credibility. Do you have a question? Does it make you go, oh, I'm not quite sure? You have to consider the source. Who would benefit from spreading confusing myths or disinformation? Do these stories or do these pictures appeal to your emotions? You have to look at the author. Is that person truly an expert? Does the article have a byline? Who do they work for? You have to examine posts and stories for the spelling and punctuation. Is it in all caps? Is it poor grammar? Are there misspelled words? Is excessive punctuation? Are often huge clues that the source is unreliable. You have to be aware of tropes. Those are the people who keep repeating the same lie or the same pattern of information. And you need to be proactive about getting your news. You can't rely on the algorithms of the social media com uh, companies. You need to search for other articles and sources on the same topic. Do lateral reading, which is reading about the same topic from those different sources. But we also have to be aware of media bias. A news sources can be placed on a spectrum of bias, more biased or less biased. Knowing that media bias exists also helps you get a fuller picture 
so that you can reach your own conclusions and not rely on the information someone else wants you to believe. Now, we also have to be aware that mis and disinformation can also spread in other ways as technology expands, such as text messaging. You need to question and you need to report suspicious messaging. Mis and disinformation can be stopped by each and every one of us. You have to resist the urge to share and like without in verifying the information. You have to report the mis and disinformation you see. We can't be silent about it. We need to report it. On Google, you can scroll to the bottom of the page and click on send feedback. On social media, such as X and Facebook and Instagram, there'll be three dots or a chevron in the upper right-hand corner of that post that will give you a pop-up box that gives you options to report. If you know someone who is sharing mis and disinformation, think about talking to them privately about the content that they're sharing. It can be a tough grant, a conversation, I grant you. But if you're respectful, if you try and understand their beliefs by good listening, you will be heard in return. It's hard to change people's attitudes. Social science would totally agree with that statement. But if you stay calm, positive, and empathetic, you can get your message across. You need to listen attentively. Ask them questions. Where did you get your information? How did you come to believe that? Don't argue with them, though, as that will only make their beliefs stronger and confirm in their mind that they're right when they become in a defensive position. Hopefully what you can do is you can find some common ground that you'll be able to build on. So there's tons of resources out there and I've only just listed a few. If you want to fact check something, Snopes, factcheck.org, Reuters fact check, or Rumor Guard are great places to go and see what's true and what's not true. It's, those are all nonpartisan sites that go through a thorough vetting of information so that they can verify statements on social media or in the news. Other resources for further information on mis and disinformation. I mean, I hope you'll visit the uh, League of Women Voters of Illinois website at lwvil.org or the News Literacy Project is a great um, nonprofit organization that provides many clues far beyond what I've gone over tonight. And they are the, also the sponsors of Rumor Guard. And there also is another great site, which is the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency that has inf a great deal of information about how you become more careful as you're going forward to be aware of mis and disinformation. So I'm gonna leave you with questions that you need to always ask yourself. I wish I had a great mnemonic to share with you, but the questions you really need to ask yourself is what I'm reading authentic? It has what I'm reading been posted or confirmed as a reliable source? Is there evidence that proves that this claim is correct? Is the context correct? Or is the article itself or the picture, is it based on some solid reasoning? Um, I hope you'll keep in contact with um, the task force in the coming year. We have monthly programs from experts on mis and disinformation. We also are going to be providing um, social media posts on election security and integrity so that we can rebuild our faith in an election process. And we will be having handouts to be given to local libraries and schools so that we can all work together to become more aware of mis and disinformation and to help fight it going forward and to stop it going forward. So Bill, that's all I've got prepared. So if there's any questions from the audience, perhaps we can take them and um, see if there's something more specific that we they would like to see us talk about.
Okay, great. Great. Well, if, uh, if folks have anything to share or any questions, please type it into the chat and we'll go through those questions. I'll give you guys a few minutes or a couple minutes to think about things and uh, key them in. in. In the meantime, Barb, can can you go back to, I, I'm, I'm just curious, um, you know, you mentioned lateral viewing and lateral consumption. I mean, um, you know, you personally, how, how do you sort of do that? You know, recognizing even, you know, main so-called mainstream media sources can sometimes have a, a tilt left or right. So how do you personally go about, you know, kind of cross comparing? Do you watch a little bit of Fox and a little bit of MSNBC? I mean, how do you how do you personally handle it? I actually do that. I actually read I try and read something from the Washington Post, but then I look at I try and look at it in the Chicago Tribune, which would I I would consider to have a more right bias. I also um, look at Reuters, which is more neutral, and try and pick out stories just to see if the if if the the t intent is the same and the conclusions are the same. Um, I think that reading, I mean, I even read the Associated Press, which a lot of no newspapers pick up on their stories. And they have great fact checking um, capabilities. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can see everybody. Um, there is a there is a website I'll tell you about. It's called All Sides, and AllSides.com is a, a a nonprofit organization that what it does is it takes stories from the left and stories for the right so that you can read and see the slant and bias on both sides. It also has on its website a media bias chart um, that has been developed by uh, multiple, multiple people's input, um, though I have heard many people say that those bias charts are biased. So I think what you have to do is develop your own trusted resources, but make sure they're from both sides of the spectrum. Right. Good advice. Well, we've had a few questions roll in. Um, uh, one is is uh, more of an administrative question, but it's an excellent one. Where and when will this, this presentation uh, be recorded and where can people find it if they want to watch it again or share it with somebody? Um, I'm going to assume that it's going to be on the League of Women Voters of Naperville website. Um, we are going to um, post it on the LWEIL, the League of Illinois website on the Miss and Disinformation um, page. We have a whole page on the website devoted to Miss and Disinformation Perfect. that will be added to as the year goes on. Perfect. Okay. Um, one question, uh, you mentioned some of these sites. I think somebody wanted to know in particular, is there a site that you can go to if you want to try to verify a, uh, an image, a photograph as to whether it's legit? Yes. If you, um, you can do a Google image search. And one of the ways you do that is I, I have to say, I'm not a tech expert. But if you Google how to do an image search, it'll tell you it's a matter of right clicking on it. And then the Google will search the image and it will tell you where it originally appeared. Huh. And that's how I found the map was actually not from that post. It was a map from an original post from three years earlier that someone used and manipulated. So Google image search is a, is a good way to find out the original source of images. So okay. you, would, if it's on Facebook, you would copy the image, paste it into the, paste it into Google and then do an image search. Great. Great. Uh, let's see. Someone would like to hear more about how you talk to people who live in a disinformation bubble. Uh, and we all know, uh, have loved ones probably that, that, uh, 
uh, might might fit that characteristic. You suggested not challenging facts, but can you give a suggested conversation? Okay, so someone comes to me and says um, says something about the um, during the eclipse. Do you know that um, the cows stopped giving milk? Um, which is actually something I read on social media the other day during the eclipse, and. You know, my question to them would be, um, where did where did where did you get that information from? Um, did you and when they would answer, well, I saw it on Facebook. Um, then another question would be, well, did you did you check that out with any farmers or have you talked to anybody that personally had that happen? And the whole idea is to keep asking them questions so that what they begin to realize is that they don't have answers for what they're for what they're saying and eventually they would go oh well I don't know and then you could say to them well does it bother you that you don't really know where that information comes from the big thing to avoid is saying oh well that's stupid because right away they're going to get defensive right and they're going to say well I read it and it's true so the key is, is to be calm, listen to what they're saying, and just ask them more and more questions so that a light bulb goes off in their head and says, well, wait a minute, maybe, maybe that's not true. You know, mm. if it's about a political question or a political candidate, one of the things I'll ask is, and they're extolling the benefits of a candidate or whatever, I would say, well, is there anything you do the candidate did that you don't like? Just to get them doing some alternative thinking and thinking things through is, is a good question. And you, everybody wants, can be a good teacher and have the patience to let the person work it through so that you once again can have a good Thanksgiving dinner you know, and a good Christmas so that you don't have to talk about the weather all the time, right? <laughs> Seems like you missed your calling as uh, like a family therapist or a <laughs> counselor. So I think you'd be excellent at that. <laughs> yeah, well, great. Well, I think that pretty much hits the the main questions. Um, a couple of folks have helpfully chimed in and pointed out that um, these forums are on the League of Women Voters Naperville's YouTube channel. So oh, okay. if you Google that, you'll find it out there as well. So, um, well, I'm gonna that, call on, I, I'm gonna call on Linda, maybe, who's a member of the Naperville League of Women Voters, and kind of put her on the spot here, and see if there's anything else that she thinks um, she would like to add. Linda is chair of our education committee for the task force, and has done a phenomenal amount of work and research to gather information for us to put into other presentations that will go more into depth and other and publications for us to put out into the communities. Linda, do you have anything that you would like to add? Yes, I would like to add, I should probably show myself. There are, there are other resources there um, for having civil conversations. One of them is from Braver Angels. It's called Skills for Bridging the Divide. And it's a self-guided e-course that can help you frame your conversations with people. There's another one from the National Institute of Civil Discourses called Living Room Conversations. And another one called Bridging Differences Playbook by the Greater Good Science Center. So um, we we will add those resources to our um, website so that people at LWVIL so that people can easily find them and resources and resource them as the year goes along. Mm -hmm. So. Well, great. Anything else, Linda, to share? No. There'll be more coming because this is a long-term project and there'll be other topics that we're going to be covering. This is more or less the introduction. Yeah. Right. This is this is Miss and Disinformation 101. <laughs> and there'll be other presentations that go into more in depth about each of the topics we talked about, such as detecting Miss and Disinformation. We'll go into more detail about 
the, the science behind our thinking that allows us to go into, to accept mis and disinformation. So um, there'll be in-depth programs throughout the year to help us understand what's going on so that we can combat it and stop it. Well, with the uh, the ensuing election season, um, I'm sure we'll all have reasons to turn to this information over and over again. So, so thank you very much, Barb. This was fantastic. We really appreciate you joining us. Um, and to our viewers, uh, if you enjoyed this event uh, and appreciate the community and civic work of the League of Women Voters of Naperville, consider joining us. Just go to the join page of our website and uh, it, you can sign up. It's really painless and super fast and be an official member. So great. Well, thanks everyone once again, and uh, I hope everyone has a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.